Okay, so I'm reading Let, Letting Swift River Go by Jane Yon. When I was six years old, the world seemed a very safe place. The wind whispered comfortably through the long branches of the willow by the bedroom window. Mama let me walk to school all alone along the winding blacktop, past the old stone mill, past the garage hall, past our church, not even meeting up with Georgie Warren or Nancy Vaughn until the crossroads. Georgie and I fished in the Swift River in the bright days of summer, catching brown trout out of the pools with a pinhook and a bit of thread. We played mowberry peg in the graveyard and picnicked on Grandpa Will's stone, the black one that stayed warm all day by soaking up the hot summer sun. And many a summer's night, I slept under the backyard maples with Nancy Vaughn. We listened to the trains starting and stopping along Rabbit Run, their long whispers alone into the dark, startling the screech owl off its perch and on the great elm. Lying there, looking up at the lengthening shadows of the trees, we see the fireflies winking on and off. At this point, I'm thinking, she has a lot of freedom. Um, when I was six years old, I didn't get to do nearly this much. I mean, they're sleeping, we can see, by themselves in the middle of a field. So I know this book must have taken place back in the day, I would assume. Just from the pictures and stuff, too. One night, Nancy Vong and her cousin Sarah from the city brought three mason jars to my house. We caught fireflies in them. Holding our hands over the open tops, Mama came out to watch. She shook her head. You have to let them go, Sally Jane, she said to me. So I did. And at this point, I was thinking about how much I loved catching fireflies as a kid. That was always my favorite thing to do at night. So it's like I could put myself there and know, like, she was having fun and I always try to keep him too, so try to keep him as a pet. In the deep winter, Papa harvest, harvested ice from Greenwich Lake, and Mama kept the stove going in the house all day and all night. I slept under these ember downs and Grandma's quilt. Later in March, we put buckets up on all the maples, dipping our fingers down to the sap and tasting the thin sweetness. For this picture, it's going to sound really childish, but um, it reminded me of Frozen, the movie, because in the beginning they chop ice up, and I didn't know people really did that, but they do, obviously. But that just shows their culture is so much different, which is always neat. But then everything began to change. The men went to the Grange Hall time after time after time. The women did, too. Only no one asked us kids. They all asked to... They, they all listened to men from Boston because the city of Boston, 60 miles away, needed lots of water. Boston had what Papa called a mighty long thirst and no, one, and no water to quench it. We had water here in the valley. Good water. Clear water. Clean water. Cold water. Running between the low hills, we could trade water for money or water for new houses or water for a better life. So it was voted in Boston to drown our towns to drown our towns that the people in the city might drink. First we moved the graves. Grandpa Will's Blackstone in the Double Days, in the Drownings, in the Calves, in the Halls. Papa read the headstones on the trucks as he helped gather the small remains, hauling them into the new cemetery where everything would be fresh and green. Sometimes all the men found were buttons or teeth or a few thin bones. Papa said they left the Indians where they lay. No one wanted to bother them but I thought it was right that they remained in a sacred ground. The black flies were fierce. Papa said fierce. He had bites under his eyes, swollen like tears. I don't ever want to see those kind of flies. Then the governor sent his woodpeckers to clear the scrub and bushes, to cut down all the trees, the maples, the elms, the willows, the sycamore sac trees, and the great spreading oaks. They were stacked like drinking straws along the roads, then hauled away. This just depresses me because I just feel like if I came home and it was all gone, I'd be really sad about that. That's like your life. Our houses came next. Some are bulldozed. One great push and they went over. One after, 
After one in two centuries of standing strong against wind and snow and rain, Georgie and I watched them push down the old stone mill till the windows of one wall stared out like empty eyes at the far off hills. This is also something that made me sad because I've lived in the same house my entire life, so if I saw someone knocking it down, I wouldn't be watching. I'd be bawling like a baby. Mr. Baxter's house went by truck along the blacktop. It's his new home in another town. So is any child going to school. Nancy and I ran alongside for a while, but it had more breath than we did. We stopped panting and watched till it was out of sight. Then Mama and Papa and I moved back to New Salem, one big hill over and into a tiny house where my room was warm all winter long. Nancy and her folks went to the city to be near her cousin Sarah. I never heard where Georgie went and never even got to say goodbye. Strangers came with their big machines, building tunnels to the Wessler Dam and Good Knoll Dyke. Papa brought me over to watch most Friday afternoons. You've got to remember, Sally Jane, he said, remember our town. But it didn't seem like our town anymore. There were no trees, no bushes, no gardens, no fences, no houses, no churches, no barns, no halls. Just a long, gray wilderness. Just a hole between the hills. That's what it looks like now. Very depressing. I would be very sad. That's what I was thinking. How sad it is that she's having to go through this. Lose her friends. Her town. Pick up somewhere new. Like, oh gosh, I couldn't do it. The waters from the Dan Rivers moved slowly and silently. They rose like unfriendly neighbors halfway up the sides of the hills, covering Dana and Inchfield, Prescott and Greenwich, all little swift river towns. It took seven long years. Much later when I was growing, Papa and I rode out the Quanabian Reservoir. Behind us, we left a bubble trail. Through the late afternoon and well into the evening, we sat in a little boat and Papa pointed over the side. Look, Sally Jane, he said. That's where the road to Prescott ran, and that's the road to the Beaver Brook, and that's the spot the church stood where we had you baptized, and the school, and the grange yard, and the old stone mill. We won't be seeing those again. I looked. I thought I could see the faint outlines, but I could not read that past. Little Perch now owned these streets and bass swamp over the country roads. A rainbow trout leaped over a fly, and the water rings rippled through my father's carefully mapping. When it got dark, the stars came out, reflecting in the water, winking on and off and on and off like fireflies. I leaned over the side of the boat and caught the starry, starry water in my cupped hands. For a moment, I remembered the wind through the willow, the trains whistling on the rabbit run, the crossroads where I met Georgie Warren and Nancy Vaughn, gone, all gone, under the waters. Then I heard my mother's voice coming to me over the drowned years. You have to let them go, Sally Jane. I looked down to the darkening deeps and smiled, and then I did. So that's the end of the book. I really like at the end how it mentions fireflies again, and then mentions how her mom said to let them go. But now it's more like a metaphor to let the past go. No, she didn't have any fireflies, obviously. So I think that was pretty neat how that book kind of transcends that. But, yep.